Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today I have several questions related to post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and the coronavirus pandemic. Will the coronavirus pandemic result in a PTSD pandemic? Who is at risk for PTSD because of the pandemic? Can the pandemic cause PTSD? And does social distancing make all this worse? Does it increase the risk for post-traumatic stress disorder? So mental health clinicians are protective of certain diagnoses. And I'll specifically relate this to PTSD, but first I'll give some examples of how they're protective of other disorders. And this type of protective sense is not in an ownership sense, like it's mine and you can't have it. Rather, there are certain characteristics of some disorders that have made clinicians reluctant to diagnose. These characteristics would include a diagnosis being misunderstood, having a distinctive set of symptoms or course, diagnoses that carry a stigma, and diagnoses that are expensive to treat, so like an extended duration or there's some specific treatment that's been designed for them. So clinicians don't want to risk a false positive with a number of diagnoses. They want to make sure that everyone who they say has it actually has it. So some examples, obsessive compulsive disorder. This disorder is misunderstood. Sometimes we see people saying that they are perfectionistic or they like things a certain way. Therefore, they must have OCD. When, of course, OCD is much different than that. It has obsessions and compulsions. Now, the personality disorder, OCPD, that does relate to perfectionism. But still, that's much more severe than just liking things arranged a certain way. With depression, we see this is misunderstood. Often people, when they're sad or down, will use the word depressed. When depression actually has a relatively specific course, major depressive disorder is a cyclic or episodic disorder. We see schizophrenia and bipolar. These have a distinctive set of symptoms and a distinctive course. All mental disorders are serious, but schizophrenia and bipolar really stand out in terms of the level of impairment associated with those disorders. Then we see the cluster B personality disorders. That would be antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic. They have a stigma associated with them. So clinicians are going to be careful with those disorders as well. And we see something like substance use disorder, which has usually a different set of treatment guidelines because there are certain facilities that only treat people with substance use disorders. So if you sent somebody into one of those facilities and they did not have a substance use disorder, that would be a waste of resources and counterproductive. Now, not every disorder is like this. Mental health clinicians tend to diagnose some disorders without really too much worry, like adjustment disorder. Even though that disorder is actually relatively well-defined, it has this reputation as a catch-all in the mental health treatment community. So if you can't figure out what's going on with the client, you give them adjustment disorder. I don't support that, but it is done quite commonly. Now, among these disorders that are protected, as I mentioned, we have post-traumatic stress disorder, and this one really stands out. All the reasons I talked about before can actually apply to PTSD. It's misunderstood. We see a lot of confusion with acute stress disorder. A lot of clinicians don't know the difference between those disorders. We see a distinctive symptom set and course. It's the only disorder other than acute stress disorder that requires a qualifying trauma. We, of course, see a stigma. It is incorrectly associated with violent behavior. Post-traumatic stress disorder has that bad reputation that isn't earned through any scientific evidence. It's just something that we see that has become a popular way of thinking about it. And, of course, it has a specific set of treatments associated with it, including long-term counseling. So with this idea that clinicians might be reluctant to diagnose PTSD in mind, when we look at the coronavirus, could the existence of this virus, and it's spread throughout a number of communities, could this qualify as a traumatic event? I think the answer is, of course, yes. There is a risk of death associated with coronavirus. There's the sense that the spread of coronavirus is inevitable. Now, of course, it's not inevitable, but I'll talk about this idea I thought of when I was contemplating this idea about an old movie, but I'll save that to the end of the video because there's nothing really scientific about that. We also see there's a lot of fears around having financial problems. Now, technically, of course, this would not qualify as a traumatic event, but in one sense, it really could. 
if the financial problems were severe enough, they could result in people not having food, not having shelter, and this could become life-threatening. So let's take a look at the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder and look at how the criteria can relate to the pandemic. So as I mentioned, PTSD requires a qualifying trauma. And there's four different types of traumatic event in this definition. Directly being exposed to the traumatic event. So with coronavirus, that's pretty clear. Everyone has the risk of being exposed to the virus. If one were to witness in person other people being exposed to a traumatic event, we can see how this could happen with the coronavirus pandemic. Learning about the traumatic event occurring to a family member or close friend. This has happened many, many times with this pandemic and repeated exposure to aversive details of the traumatic event, right? So this is not really necessarily applicable to everybody because it has to be work-related if it's related to media. So if somebody's watching television or looking something up on the internet, it would have to be their job in order to count toward this criterion. But in general, we see a number of ways here where coronavirus would qualify. So it does qualify as a traumatic event, potentially. Then we have to look at the other symptoms associated with PTSD. They are broken into four categories, intrusion, avoidance, negative mood, and arousal. So with intrusion, we see like memories and flashbacks. And of course, these can occur before the traumatic event is over. So at the time I'm making this video, coronavirus is still out there, still causing death and suffering. There is no vaccine right now, again, as of the date of making this. So it's an ongoing event. So some people have asked, well, how can a memory or a flashback occur if the event is ongoing? Well, it can still happen. It can still be what the person's thinking about all the time, and they can just have a memory of a few days ago or a few weeks ago. Now, dreams are also a part of this, and I've heard some different theories about the dreams. Like some people have said, look, is the person dreaming that they're being chased by like a big coronavirus or something? It doesn't have to be something like that. It can just be a dream related to, again, a fear of death or like a fear of great suffering. It doesn't have to be something fanciful like being chased by a huge coronavirus. Now, with avoidance, here we see people avoiding memories, thoughts, feelings, and reminders. And we already see some evidence that this is happening on a larger scale. People are often overwhelmed about the amount of information and misinformation being spread about the coronavirus. Now, with negative mood, now this gets interesting because we see a self-blame aspect of this. This can occur in the context of coronavirus. For example, if somebody goes out to their mailbox and they accidentally get closer than they should to another person, they might start to be fearful and start to blame themselves like they could have caused a lot of difficulty there, like they could have spread the virus. And of course they could have, but that's more like an honest mistake, like somebody not thinking about it. We also see with negative mood, fear, shame, horror, anger, guilt, all those are possible here. Now we see a diminished interest in participation in significant activities. And we also see feelings of detachment or estrangement from others. And I think this gets really tricky because those symptoms could come from the social distancing, not necessarily something related to like a fear of death or a fear of great suffering. So again, we have to be careful with some of these symptoms. Of course, one could think about it this way. The coronavirus led to the social distancing. So the coronavirus is still the cause of all this. Then we have arousal. And arousal has a few different potential symptoms, including hypervigilance. And we've seen this. People are very alert to how much distance they're maintaining. And that can become problematic. Like they can become too vigilant about that. We see trouble sleeping. And we see trouble concentrating as well with arousal. And we know that's been happening quite a bit too. Now, these symptoms have to be present for more than a month. Otherwise, acute stress disorder might be a better fit. They also have to cause clinically significant distress. So they really have to interfere in functioning. This can be hard to gauge right now because if somebody is out of work or working from home, they might be functioning all right. But then when they go back into the workforce or go back to working face-to-face, -face, there could be problems. So that can be difficult to assess at this particular moment. Also, the symptoms can't be better explained by substance use or another condition. And of course, I would expect that substance use is probably pretty high right now because of all the stress and because some people have a restricted range of options what they can do for recreation. So again, I believe there has been an increase in that behavior. So as we see how coronavirus and PTSD could have this relationship where coronavirus could cause PTSD, 
I have six clinical characteristics, six clinical factors that clinicians and non-clinicians may want to be aware of. So number one, make sure that the traumatic event is tied to the symptoms, right? So the presence of a traumatic event doesn't necessarily explain the symptoms. It can actually be misleading. So I've had clinical experiences before with individuals who were involved in like motor vehicle accidents, and then they had symptoms after that. But then later on, what I realized was not all those symptoms, and sometimes none of those symptoms, were actually tied to the accident. It was really just a coincidence. So we have to make sure the symptoms actually tie back to the event. So some of those symptoms could be related to factors that already existed or to new factors that are unrelated to the coronavirus. This is especially true for negative mood and arousal because some of those symptoms are really non-specific. They're not just tied to trauma. Number two, consider how this situation may be around a while, right? So this reminds me of clinical experiences I've had where I'm treating somebody who is with a perpetrator, right? So the trauma isn't something in the past. The trauma is something that's happening right now. So as a clinician, you have to ask yourself, are they recovering? What does recovery look like if they're still with the perpetrator? And can somebody recover when they're actually with the perpetrator? Another question, of course, that comes up is why are they still there? But a lot of times in these situations, the person has no choice. Another note here, social distancing has forced couples to spend more time together. And if the relationship was characterized by intimate partner violence before the pandemic or something like narcissism, like severe levels of narcissism exposure, then it could be a lot worse now. And I think in most instances, that's probably the case, right? People were forced together. The relationship was already not working because of the abuse. So now it's just become a nightmare. So again, that's an ongoing trauma. Item number three, it's important to treat post-traumatic stress early. It's tempting to delay treatment right now because everything's telehealth, everything's online. So it's tempting to say, well, I'll just wait till face-to-face -face counseling is available again and then deliver treatment or then seek treatment. But best results here with post-traumatic stress disorder are found when treating the symptoms right away. So likely the treatment would have to be online. Not all mental disorders are like that. It's always good to deliver treatment as early as possible, but with some disorders, it's not as crucial to get in there early and deliver the counseling treatment. Item number four, watch out for self-disclosure. It's really easy to do in the situation because everybody has been exposed to the risk. So it's easy to say, well, I understand how you feel because I have concerns about being infected by coronavirus or what would happen to me if I were infected, what the outcome would be. I find that self-disclosure is actually not that useful. I think it's rarely helpful. And I know there are many opinions on this, but throughout my career, I've seen a lot of instances where self-disclosure has gone terribly wrong and only a few instances where it was really like a moment of genius. Now, again, it's much more tempting when the counselor is exposed to the same stressor, right? So before coronavirus, it could be something like a client comes in and they had experienced like intimate partner violence. If the counselor had experienced that, they might say, oh, the same things happened to me. If they didn't experience it, of course, they wouldn't say that. But again, with coronavirus, everyone has that exposure. And that temptation is just so great to jump in and say, yeah, I completely understand. But of course, counselors rarely completely understand, right? We do our best to understand, but the client's always going to have experiences that we can't quite grasp. So again, just important to avoid that temptation. Item number five, with PTSD, many combinations of symptoms can lead to the diagnosis. In that sense, it's actually overcomplicated. Technically speaking, there are 636,120 possible presentations of PTSD. So we should expect differences from one presentation to the next. This is true for any mental disorder, but I think it's something we need to really be aware of when we're talking about a disorder that has so many different presentation types. Item number six, the quarantine itself can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. And here I'm really using the word quarantine interchangeably with social distancing. Of course, technically they're two different things, but for many people, they've essentially become the same thing. And we do see some research here specifically about quarantines. And again, I think much of this research can apply to social distancing. 
we see that certain individuals appear to be more at risk. We see individuals in the age range from 16 to 24 are at a greater risk, which is interesting because, of course, they're actually at a lower risk for COVID-19. We see that females are at a greater risk than males. And whether somebody is male or female, having one child as opposed to no children is a risk factor. Now, interestingly, having three or more children is actually a protective factor. So it's not clear what's going on there, but it is either way what we see in the research literature. Also, pre-existing mental disorders are a risk factor for somebody developing PTSD when they're in a quarantine-like situation. So now moving to those questions I asked in the very beginning, and of course I've more or less answered all these, but I'll just go through them and give a succinct answer. Will the coronavirus pandemic result in a PTSD pandemic? I think there will be an increase in the diagnosis of PTSD, but I don't think it's really going to become something like a pandemic. Who is at risk for post-traumatic stress disorder because of coronavirus? Well, technically everyone. I think more at risk, of course, would be those groups I talked about before, as well as healthcare providers and first responders. Can coronavirus cause PTSD? I talked about this before. Yes, it can. And does social distancing make it worse? The answer is yes. It's necessary to reduce the spread of the virus, but it does come at a cost. So earlier I was talking about how there's this feeling that some people have, that everybody will be exposed to coronavirus, that it's inevitable. And this, of course, can be very discouraging. And this really reminded me of a movie from 1984 called Ghostbusters. I remember seeing this when it first came out in the theater. It's actually not one of my favorite movies, but it's probably in the top 50 or so. Like, I thought it was a good movie. And we see in the final scene of this movie, there's this ghost, Gozer the Gozerian, who asked the Ghostbusters to choose the form of their destructor, right? Because he was going to destroy the world. And Ray, one of the Ghostbusters, thinks of the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, who's really like this 100-foot-tall, well, Marshmallow Man that kind of looks like the Michelin Man a little bit, and I guess sort of like the Pillsbury Doughboy as well, like a combination of both of those figures. And of course, it was meant to be humorous. I thought it was a funny scene. And I think here that there's this sense in this scene that they were going to think of something. The Ghostbusters were going to think of something. It was inevitable. They just had the option, again, of choosing the form of their destructor. They couldn't prevent the destruction. They could just decide how they wanted it. But it's important to remember that the Ghostbusters defeated the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. And I think, of course, we will defeat coronavirus. It's just a function of time. It's just a matter of getting to that point where we have a vaccine available. As I was thinking about this, there were actually some interesting parallels with Ghostbusters, more than just the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. We see the Ghostbusters had financial difficulty as a result of ghost busting. We see they had a lot of fear and anxiety as they were fighting these ghosts, a lot of confusion. So there are actually several parallels to that movie. Also, the character Ray thought of the Marshmallow Man because he was trying to think of something that would be harmless, that could never cause any type of destruction. And of course, we're dealing with an invisible microorganism that, of course, we know can be destructive and is, but it's not something we would readily think of. It's invisible. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So before all this happened, most people really weren't worried about a microorganism any more than they were worried about a 100-foot marshmallow man. I know whenever I talk about topics like post-traumatic stress disorder and coronavirus, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.